percent of all grain-fed beef coming out of all feedlots in the U.S. is choice or prime. Anybody know? Between 50 and 55 percent annually. So if we think just because you put them in a feedlot and feed them grain for 150 days, they're going to break choice and up? No. no. We have crappy grain-fed beef out there as well. And that's not hurting, that's not helping us either things. Okay, we've got to understand that. If we want to increase total beef market share, whether it's grass finished, grain finished, however it's finished, we need to be getting our act together and, and starting to produce a much higher percentage of consistent quality beef. We're not there on either phase of finishing. We are not there. And that's our fault in this industry. You know, what are the reasons we're not there? One is genetics. Okay? We're not doing a very good job genetically in the U.S. We've got a lot of what I call mongrelized cattle genetics out there. We've got to do a much better job of improving our genetics. What's your average age of your cattle when you do what? 18 to 22 months at between 12 and 13 live weight with about a 60 to 61 dressing percent. We're also seeing a significant growth in the grass fed dairy sector, so that's increasing rapidly. How many people are familiar with Seven Sons in Indiana, okay, in the Hits Fields? <coughs> Folks, they're an example of what you can do, right? And there's a lot of other examples around the U.S. today, like, like the Hitsville. But they were a conventional Indiana farm, row cropping operation, okay? But very conventional. They're seven sons, so the name is appropriate. Lee and his wife, Lee Hitzfield and his wife were the patriarch, matriarch of the family. The seven sons all wanted to come back to the operation. They couldn't figure out how to even bring in one of the seven in support. Of them. And they were row cropping several thousand acres. Weren't making enough money off of several thousand acres of row crops in Indiana to even return one son full time to the farm. So they started looking around at options. They, they started going to conferences like the Grass Fed Exchange Conference and similar types of conferences. And they made a decision. When they made the decision, they dived headlong into it. And they transitioned their crop ground into grazing ground. And they put in multiple, spe multiple species. And they started producing grass fed beef and pasture pigs and free range eggs. And, pastured poultry, pastured lamb, and those types of things. And they let go of all their leased acres. They kept only their deeded acres. So today they only have 550 deeded acres. Those 550 deeded acres support eight families, Lee and his wife and the seven sons and their families. Eight families, full time, no one works outside of the farm, and supports 21 employees, right, of 550 acres. But look at what they're generating per acre. Yeah, so again, there's significant opportunity here in things that can occur. So this is where we want to place ourselves. Uh, what are some of our challenges in the grass fed sector today? Well, we have some programs that are doing, you know, feedlot style grass fed. So they're putting them in feedlots, finishing them in a feedlot. They're using a lot of grain byproducts like DDGs and wet corn gluten and things like that. Uh, so we've got that that we're working with. The imported grass fed and the lack of country of origin labeling. Okay? So it doesn't really bother me that we don't have country of origin labeling except for one reason. What's that one reason? Anybody know? Any imported beef product brought into the U.S. can be marketed how? When you see it on the retail grocery store shelf, do you know that it's an imported beef product? No. 
because there's no kosher of origin requirement, right? So they don't put it on there. But the average consumer thinks it was produced in the U.S. Why? Why? Okay. Because it's legal for any imported beef product, or pork, by the way. Pork also is exempt from country of origin. Okay. So any beef or pork that comes in the U.S., 100% of it passes through a USDA processing plant to be repackaged before it goes to the grocery store, right? The moment it passes through a USDA processing plant, they put a little white stamp on it that says product of USA. And that's perfectly legal. So the consumer, they see grass-fed beef and sees that little USDA seal, that say, and it says USDA, and this is product of USA, and they see that, and what do they automatically think? Oh, this was produced here in the U.S. Well, what? So they never know that they're buying imported grass-fed. That's our real problem, okay? If we're not going to require country of origin, fine, but don't allow product of USA to be stamped on it, but that, that's what's occurring right now. So we've got that to deal with. So a lot of different things to deal with. Again, I won't go through this. You can see this uh, in the slides. Uh, and I've also, we've calculated, you know, now this will happen, and I'm not even saying it should, but one of the biggest arguments about the growth of the grass-fed sector in the U.S. has been, well, we don't have enough grass. We can't, we, we can't finish enough cattle to supply all the beef we need to in the U.S. and for export market by grass finishing. We just can't do it. But actually, yes, we can. If you run through the calculations, and again, this will be on the slides, and I've written articles about this as well in grays that you can, you can get. But here's the bottom line, okay? Right there. We have enough grass in the U.S. right now without replacing cow-calf and stocker operations in any way to finish 42 million head annually on grass alone. We can already do it. How many head of cattle total are there finished in the U.S. annually? Anybody know? About 29 to 30 million. So right now we already have enough grass if we utilize it in the U.S. to finish more cattle than we have cattle. We don't even have that many cattle to finish annually in the U.S. Right? So we can do it. So that's not really the issue, okay? And I did that just to take that argument off the table as an argument. It's not an argument. We can do it if we want to. Now, will it ever happen? No, because we need to be able to offer consumers choices in their beef products, okay? I'm a big proponent of that because consumers do want choices, and we need to be able to do that. So, all right, one more quick thing. And I'm gonna let Rod jump up here. Alright, on selective genetics, another way, folks, for us to make money, reduce our input costs, increase our margins and our profitability is in our genetic selection. It's this simple. There's absolutely nothing complicated about it. We have made it far, far too complicated. It is truly this simple. Okay? Number one trait, number one, number one, number one. I need to say it again, Rod. I won't. Right. <laughs> if you're a cow calf producer, longevity, don't be selecting them for EPDs on marbling or ribeye or weaning weight or anything else, folks. Select your cows, number one, based on longevity. Why? Why? Here's why. The average beef cow in the U.S., when she's called for whatever reason, whether she failed to breed as a heifer the first time, failed to rebreed after the first calf, or blew an udder, or whatever happened, 
lost a calf, but the average age of culling a beef cow in the U.S., she has had how many calves when the average cow, beef cow in the U.S. is culled? 4.3 calves. The average beef cow has only had 4.3 calves by the time she's culled. The average beef cow investment in the U.S., how many calves does it take? Yep, he said it already. It takes five calves for her to break even on her investment. So the average beef cow never makes money because she's not sticking around long enough in your herd to make money, okay? Where they really start cranking is by that eight, eight calf. So I want cows that are gonna last well into their teens and late teens and even early 20s. That's what I want. So longevity is the number one trait, but what do you have to have for longevity? You have to have adaptability, fertility, and soundness. All of these things contribute to longevity. If I don't have these, I also don't have that. I also want moderate frame because larger frame cattle are not going to have this on the average. You'll have far, far more large frame cattle falling out on this account and all of this than you will very moderate frame cattle. Easy flashing cattle, so the proper phenotype. So real quick, here's what you're looking for. Okay, you're looking for animals. If we're viewed from the rear, they have a lot more width in that lower third of the midrib than anywhere else in the body. Red angus bull in working condition. Look at the tremendous depth of body, heart girth, expression in this lower two thirds of the midrib section here. You know, excellent mus musculature on this animal in his working clothes. Again, an Angus bull showing the same traits, Herford bull. You know, so it doesn't matter the breed, you know, but rather what we're looking for. That might be. Yeah. Those look distorted. I'm not sure if they're distorted or not, but they look distorted based on what I'm seeing here. He looks like he's a lot more compact here. So some distort, distort the slides. To give the same thing on the cows, on cows deep, a lot of, a lot of depth of body, lower two thirds of the midrib, very feminine, excellent sound udders, excellent feet and legs, they gotta last a long time. You know, so these are the core traits that I look for in cows above and beyond anything else. But here's what I'm discovering. I also work with a lot of grass fed dairies. And what we have discovered is that the basic phenotype that works on grass, whether you're doing grass-fed beef or grass-fed dairy, is the same phenotype. Take a look at these. Okay? Take a look at these. Grass-fed dairy, beef, same phenotype. Beef, dairy, same phenotype. So that's what we're finding. They have the same basic phenotype. So here's our keys to high quality grass finishing. And again, you can download all of this and we can talk more about it this afternoon if you want to. Um, but soil health and the genetics are absolutely the top two. And then you add all the adaptive grazing, the three principles that I went through applied. And bricks, how many people know what bricks are? Okay. Bricks is the dissolved plant solids and the sap of the plant, including sugars, minerals, amino acids, proteins, lipids, and pectins. In other words, bricks represent the nutrient content of your forage. You measure it using refractometers, pretty simple and easy to do. Do we have a refractometer today? Anybody? I got one. You got one with you? Great. We'll do it this afternoon then, just show you real quick how to do bricks. I don't have any still water. What kind of refractometer you got? Uh, the uh, Tago. This? Yep. We don't need that. Good. We're good. Yep. All right. Very simple. We'll show you how to do it this afternoon with these are slides. Doing that. When we have higher bricks plants, we get improvement in animal gains and milk and milk components if they're dairy. Our plants perform better, right? Is it true that if you cut, you know, if you're making hay in the evenings or afternoons, that's the thing you cut? That's correct. 
You'll have much higher grades in the afternoon. All right, this is the bottom line. This is why it's so important. Okay. Bricks at 5% or less, that's the average pasture across North America, not just the US, but Canada, Mexico as well. The average bricks is 5 or less. All right. You can't get average daily gains without additional supplementation above the low ones. If you got bricks averaging 15% or greater, you've got feedlot quality average daily gains. When you run the regression coefficient, the regression equations, we found that for every 1% increase in bricks above a base of 3%, so the base is 3%, okay? For every 1% increase in bricks, you're gonna get another 1 tenth to 3 tenths of a pound average daily gain. This is the same thing shown diagrammatically. We don't see it starting to plateau until you get your plant bricks up into the low to, low to mid 20s, okay? So you get steady increase in animal performance up until this point as you increase plant bricks. Again, this is showing single season impact, side-by-side -side comparisons of conventional versus adaptive grazing, and a single season impact of plant bricks just by switching to adaptive grazing. It's pretty powerful. And then here's where you need to be grazing if you want optimal animal performance and best grass finishing. Mid-stage forage maturity, not early highly vegetated, okay? Protein's way too high, sugar's way too low, protein to energy ratio, way out of whack. What kind of rations fed in the feedlot? High protein or high energy? Do you ever see a finishing ration in a feedlot that's high protein? No, ever. So why do we insist on trying to finish our cattle on high protein forages? Why do we think that's going to finish them well and produce a quality end product? We need the same type of ration on grass that we have in the feedlot. High energy, lower protein. Okay? That's what's going to do the best job. So this is our sweet spot, that mid-stage maturity. So here's your, this, I'm going to finish with this, okay? These are two things that are too big to ignore. Do these two simple things, you'll add another quarter to half pound a day average day to get to your cat if you're finishing or running stock. Grazing at the right stage of maturity of your forage, we just talked about that mid stage, and then the timing of your daily moves. When did we say we wanted to cut hay? Afternoon. Afternoon. That's when we want to move cattle. If we want the best gains, the best finishing performance on our cattle, if you're moving them once a day, wait till early afternoon to make that move. Don't move in the mornings. Your plant bricks is at its lowest of every 24 hour photo period in the morning. Just simply wait till the afternoon. You've changed nothing to get an additional quarter of a pound average day of the gain, except altered the time of day that you move the cattle. That's all you did. That's a pretty simple move to make. You combine those two together, you easily get another half pound a day average daily gain. Think about the power of that. Think how much, that's how we get that high percentage choice of prime. Okay? That's how that's accomplished. So I'm going to stop there. Again, all of this is available or will be available at pastureproject.org. And I'm going to turn it over to Rod. Rod is going to introduce our grass to beef calculator and the economic side of all of this. Rod? with some of you, I have my own like spreadsheet that I use with some of you, 
but he's got, a, and it comes out to about the same. You know, the dollars per acre, should I plant corn or should I grow beef? And almost, well, every time it comes out ahead. They're always further ahead planting, I mean, growing beef than it is planting grow crop, especially corn. And so I think that's what, that's what Rod wants to share with us today. Uh, just to kind of get thanks, Serge. Uh, and thanks very much. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces out there, so I apologize in advance for those of you that heard me have to listen to me ramble again. <laughs> uh, I'm excited about the opportunity because uh, if you were at Grassworks, I touched on these tools, but we were we had so much information we weren't able to uh, really go into them, and we're going to take the time to, to run through that. I've got uh, I'm going to do some shameless pitch for the co-op because the co-op is the means that gives us the ability to market at a premium. So I want to share with you guys how to do that. If you're interested, that's great. If not, that's fine. For those of you who are having trouble seeing this, uh, sir, I'll give you a copy. If you have trouble, you know, raise your hand. I can share that. I've only did 10 printouts because I didn't want to kill too many trees. But uh, if you don't have email, maybe grab a copy of that outside. Uh, or if you have trouble seeing, uh, otherwise we're going to go through some scenarios here uh, on the computer. Um, how many co-op members do we have here already? Dan here, member? Okay, excellent. Gene, members back there. Well, thanks for coming. And uh, if you're not a co-op member, obviously this is a good chance to consider it. Uh, I'm going to build on, Alan and I do a lot of presentations together, so he does a lot of the science side, which I always find amazing. But uh, I also try to share some of the practical side, because I'm a grazer myself. I grew up on a conventional dairy farm, so I'm not a you know, tree hugger by nature, per se. But once you get into it, and I'll share you why I did, uh, you become one, and you kind of see how it all makes sense. So, uh, as I said, uh, you know, Alan does a lot of the science piece, but um, some of the sessions I go to, people really want to know the hows, you know, hows and whys. Okay, what do I plant? How deep? Where do I do it? Rather than the bigger picture. So I'm going to try to uh, share that with you. And then also, when we do those changes, what happens to the bottom line? The, the, the tools we're going to share with you are free. Uh, and then you can take them back to your operation and tweak these things. And I think it's a really neat, uh, neat exercise. Uh, so a quick story, and it is linked to financials. Um, one of the titles, I carry a lot of titles. Some of them are four-letter words, depending on who you ask. Um, but one of the titles I carry probably is farm. And I know all you do that as well. So my youngest daughter was going to school. And uh, the, the assignment was she had to uh, draw a picture of dad at work. So I was excited, thinking, okay, she's gonna be on the tractor, I'm gonna be, you know, pulling a calf and you know, picking eggs or what is it? Well, uh, to my disappointment, she came home and you know was all excited about her super picture and it had me at my desk with my earpiece in on the phone. Because <laughs> uh, that's what she thinks dad does every day, is talk on the phone. Now to some extent she's right. But I think the point is I do spend a lot of time with numbers, and the reason I like to share with, with other folks is we talk a lot about sustainability, uh, and it's incredibly important to our environment, but it's also incredibly important to our economic survival. And I see so many passionate young folks that are you know, focusing on the right this, the right that, and they think, well, numbers aren't important. I don't like a desk. I'm not a paper person. I'm not a numbers person. And the, the purpose of these tools is not to make you a numbers person, but if you don't know where you lie, where you're at financially, your operation is not sustainable. You may not be making money. And it's not about making money or not. You need to make money over the long term. You may have a job in town that pays for everything. But we've seen so many tragic stories where the young folks are working hard and they're busting their tail, but they don't know where they lie financially. They make wrong decisions. And guess what? Next thing you know, the farm for sale. Okay. And that's a tragic end. Uh, it's something we don't want to see. So that's I'll, I'll focus on those, uh, those sustainable or financial perspectives. I'm going to build a lot to touch on a few things that Alan said. Uh, but again, first the shameless pitch for the co-op. So I'm excited about the co-op. I'm a member, I'm member number 13. Uh, and it really says a lot about, I think, Wisconsin, about rural America, about uh, kind of the rural America we're trying to rebuild. So our co-op uh, was started uh, in 2008. We sold our first animal in 2009. And just a bunch of grass-fed producers that came together knew they were making something special, but were really tired of getting beat up uh, on the conventional market. Uh, but a lot of those farmers also didn't want to interact necessarily with customers and talk to retailers and talk to end consumers. So we came about and uh, made a cooperative, uh, worked hard on a protocol that we could all agree on doing. It's a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, pro protocol, so it's no corn, no antibiotics, uh, have to be free-range, never confined, 
natural meaning. So it's a really nice marketing story that we can sell to folks. Our commitment to our owners, so all of our, uh, our management team, uh, me included, are all members. So there's no Fat Cat headquarters with some big bonus you know, guy at the desk smoking a cigar can make it a big bonus. If we make extra money, it goes right back to our producer farmer members. So uh, we, tr we strive to get a 20% premium to the market. Uh, some people think, well, maybe that's not that much. But you know what? If you can consistently get 20% premium, you've got a good chance of making money and being viable. Okay? So that's a bit about our, our brand and co-op. This is the brand itself. This is a, our marketing uh, gal. She's a, a marketing professional, and, but she also does our marketing and she's also a member. Our uh, finance guy is a grass-fed beef co-op producer, but he's also a professional accountant. So uh, a neat team and a good group to work with. Um, we now, for those of you who are members, we now have 173 members. Uh, for the longest time, you know, uh, approaching on our 10th year, our 10th anniversary, our biggest struggle strategically has been a lack of cattle. And now we're getting to the point where we have the cattle, we're getting some critical mass marketing efforts, uh, growing at about uh, about the 20% Alan talked about. Uh, a lot of exciting things ahead of us. We have a USDA plant now. We're knocking on doors in Minneapolis and Chicago in addition to trying to improve our distribution across Wisconsin. So, good organization to be part of. So I'm gonna transition into uh, I guess a bit more of the beef industry and the, and the heavy financials. So this is